Nele Harting, the um, director of the visual art, nominated two artists to create a panel and will um, present itself. But I would like to present the curators of this panel. Christine Wahl, an author and critic in the Tagesspiegel Theater Heute. She worked with the Impulse Theater Festival from 2020 to 2022. She worked um, at Theater der Zeit when Lena Eilers was the editor there. She works with, on topics, the sound, for example, sound of algorithms. And that also is a bridge um, for the new topic of Mrs. Eilers. Helena Eilers currently is a prof professor f um, at a university in Munich. She has she builds up a new field of um, studies. We are looking forward to this discussion. Thank you very much, Kolja, for this nice introduction, and thank you also for the invitation to the Akademie der Künste. Before we start, have we one and a half hours, uh, or will we be limited to just one hour? 90 minutes. Okay, I see you nodding. So, okay, then we'll be. So, we have cancelled the lunch break. Dear guests, it's nice to see you in such high numbers. Our topic today is uh, the participatory work of art and the role of the critic. Before presenting our guests, we would like to highlight the matter with a paradigmatic example that uh, we have experienced uh, as critics of uh, theatrical performances. Uh, it's uh, just one example, and it is it unfolded in a theater. Now let's imagine we are sitting in a very small theater a space that is roughly a third of this room here. There are three chairs on which uh, three men are sitting. Otherwise, the stage is empty. The men come from a country in which, politically speaking, there is a lot of problems, especially oppos oppositional and artists suffer from repression or are even threatened. Uh, that's what we were expecting. Actor A starts uh, telling stories. Uh, the longer he speaks, the clearer it becomes that political large events will not play any role. On the contrary, private stories will be popping up uh, moments in act a life something goes wrong actor B tells about his personal crisis uh, and the same is true for actor C and when have you filed when have you failed please tell us don't be afraid tell about yourself after some seconds of shock and awe and embarrassment, some of the audience start reporting. Whoever went as a critic of theater was sitting in the audience uh, would start asking, what is this? Is it just a circle in some esoteric uh, cycle what is it uh, we, our job is to judge a theatrical performance under aesthetic criteria the life crisis of the neighbor sitting next to my chair the rather confusing absence of any form the healing process uh, that uh, was announced is this performance uh, unattainable for any judgment, or are we just unattainable for totally new categories? Well, I myself give it up, and I do not write any critique of this uh, theatrical performance. This uh, theater happening was uh, enacted some years ago. In the meantime, the active participation of the audience has become a standard practice in digitization. They become prosumers. 
So in this field, so many things have changed. Apart from sharing personal stories, empathy and solidarity have become instrumental. Instead, representing dramatic conflicts about uncompetitive togetherness. This is not a break. An uncompetitive togetherness. You share your uh, your vulnerabilities uh, free of company. It's about attentiveness, caring, and loving. So, if theater is considered a negotiating place for conflicts. Uh, this point can be debated once again. Well, it's an interesting event anyway. We critics, uh, will we become pro ticks? Pro means, uh, well, this uh, is somehow telling something. Well, this uh, case in point, well, led us to certain conclusions. Let me wrap it up in two minutes. Well, we. Uh, we want uh, to highlight the themes of our panel. Very briefly, let me uh, ju briefly touch upon it. One thing is clear, the participative uh, piece of arc in the theater it comes in so many forms. Uh, this will be our first point. This variety of forms uh, will be differentiated and will unfold here. We, as uh, theater critics, See, as a growing trend is a clear shift towards sharing of value ideas as a common societal practice, as uh, Dorte Lenard Eilers uh, described a moment ago, as a viewer and also as a critic. You will no longer be called upon as uh, a viewer of an aesthetic event, but more, or probably primarily, you are engulfed in a community of values. So our thesis, this changes the rules of the games for the critic as such, because this affirmative expectation by which uh, art needs to confirm your own values is miles away from the paradigm with which we and all or large swathes of the current generation of critics have grown up, have been socialized. The old scheme, well, art is the otherness, something that provokes you, that irritates you, ideally will um, inspire you. I remember in the zero uns, uh, in every, in one out of two uh, uh, critiques, you could read that we were thrown out of our comfort zone by the theatrical performance. Today, however, today's uh, theatrical arts, well, not uh, all of them, but uh, generally speaking, can be uh, described in, in a nutshell by Bernard Ulrichs, who was also sitting uh, at this conference in Bonn. He laid it down in his book, uh, Art After the End of Its Autonomy. Ulrich writes, uh, the dialogical hierarchical interrelation of work of art and recipient uh, that was so typical for the traditional art in the modernity is replaced by a new idea that viewer and producer are on the same side. U Ulrich refers to figurative arts, but his uh, diagnosis or his assessment can be taken also as an apt description of the theatrical scene. He describes uh, this shift from the aesthetic to the ethical, from the autonomous art to the po post-autonomous art. First, the intellectual or the psychic or emotional provocation to raise your curiosity. That was typical of autonomous groups. Post-autonomous forms of art aim at uh, creating the desire of sharing or of participating. However, if you are invited into a community of values, uh, then this 
call for interpretation as it was laid down in tradition. Uh, by the way, also during this conference on various panels, well, this will be limited because you may say yes or no to values, but values are self-explanatory. So the question is, uh, does this lead to a narrowing of the pluralism of interpretation that my or our generation of critics has interiorized to a dual um, uh, a binary, I agree, I don't agree. So those who don't agree will be ruled out. Will they simply no longer attend these performances while the consumers uh, are merging with the producers, uh, becoming prosumers, and they do not need also an outside, they do not need an audience. Would this mean the end of art criticism? These are, in a nutshell, the questions that motivated uh, us uh, to stage this panel and to discuss with a critic, Hanno Rauterberg, and an artist, Thorsten Michaelsen. Thorsten Michaelsen is part of the media collective Siligna, together with Ole Fram and Michael Hühners. And it is uh, particularly interesting to have you with us because you have embarked on a way that is uh, the other way around. You started with activism and then migrated into art uh, in the Freie Sender Kombinat, a radio broadcast, a free independent radio broadcast in Hamburg. You performed uh, independent journalism, and then you set up this performance collective, IGNA, in 2003. You became noticeable with the Radio Ballet. It was a performative uh, work uh, in railway stations where listeners could call in and they had uh, to they had to perform certain gestures you will tell us more about this you might also mention 2018 rausch and some studies on the authoritarian character we are going to talk about this in a moment 2022 the most recent weren't uh, the egg heads and the round heads uh, inspired by Bertolt Brecht. Bertolt Brecht is a highly relevant keyword and th because uh, you refer to participatory formats of theater. I'm going to present Hanno Rauterberg. He's an art historian. He's a critic of art and architecture. He, in 1994, was appointed at the University of Hamburg as a doctor. He, uh, he also attended the Henry Nannen Journalistenschule. He then worked for the Spiegel editors and also as an editor inside. And since 2014, he has been deputy head of department in Dietzeit. He has been dealing with these questions for a long time in a very decided and outspoken manner with the questions of the relation between aesthetics and ethics in art. For example, in his book, The Art and Good Life About Ethics of Aesthetics, which was published by Suhrkamp in 2015. Hanno Rautberg also introduced the category of post-autonomy, a subject matter that he treated again in 2018, How Free is Art, published by Suhrkamp in a new essay on today's documenta. Hanno Rautberg collected so many observations, assumptions, and thesis, assessment daughter Lina Eilers and I myself would share his views when it comes to theatrical productions. We found this very inspiring when we prepared this panel. For example, the question, why criticism in particip criticism of uh, participatory works of art is so difficult? Thorsten Michael Nelson, now you said of you are performing participatory art. Can, do, can you identify with what we described at the beginning in this uh, strange mixture of things and problems? Or would you rather say it's something totally different, what we understand by participatory art? 
Well, one of the most important starting points was to create distance, not uh, engulfing the viewers, not what we have seen here. Uh, what we do with the audience, uh, we do not want to merge with the audience. So, you mentioned it briefly, we cannot deny it. We come from Brecht, but from the uh, didactic theater of, of Brecht, they reacted to a historical experience through media interventions, the radio. Well, they concluded that the works of art become emotionally very close. There is a new proximity because you are listening in your living room. So this was a reaction. They reacted with aesthetic practices that um, then led uh, to this model of the Lehrstück didactical theatrical performance. They also included a swap of roles, uh, which led to the, a new spark of hope by distancing, a new playing through distance and problematizing became possible once again. So this was a strong role model, a shining example. The audience uh, that can become also an interacting partner. We never demand creativity. Well, we are close to Brecht again. We, are, we owe so much gratitude to Brecht. It's about uh, playing through gestures and in combination with the hope that uh, by seeing them reproduced by somebody else in another role, we can probably also gain a new uh, distance. Rausch und Zorn, fury and wrath. It was uh, the primeval, uh, primordial scene of fascism with uh, Danunzio's occupation of the city of Fiume, Rijeka, and this heroic myth that was uh, spun around this, but the, taking up also other uh, Erich Fromm's study on the authoritarian character. But it's also a localization of our work. Well, you may question it. It's rather something like uh, the idea of creating distance uh, through a certain involvement. Well, it's certainly different from artists, uh, male and female artists, uh, that uh, insist on provocation, on immersion, full immersion, that also demand a full narration. We would uh, then uh, interrupt the whole flow, and we would then interrupt and go back. So distance with reference to uh, the position of male and female critics, uh, something that uh, needs to be preserved. Keep your distance to the event that is unfolding in front of your eyes. It's uh, the analytical distance. Uh, one concept uh, was very much to my liking in another context. Uh, Lindbergh's flight, uh, according to Brecht, uh, the absence of pleasure in sharing, uh, even in distance, Genusslosigkeit, <laughs> absence of pleasure. <laughs> Mr. Rauterberg, while well, listening to you, one could say, Probably our thesis, uh, Dörte's and my thesis, is somewhat extreme. It's not about immersion based on Brecht's Lehrstück participatory performances where you have a conscientious exercise of distance. How would you describe this? What's your view on this? You have dealt intensely with so many different forms of participation. And you have also differentiated it in your book of 2015. Well, this field is um, very vast. Um, I wanted to, first of all, thank you for being able to participate. And in the first 
discussions, we found that there are many points that we have in common, and I hope that this will also um, realize itself in this panel. For me, the um, the notion of participation is a little bit overcome. I don't know if it's used at all. It has been used for three decades now, as it was formulated as a hope, the maybe passive, boring, and for to, in order to to enter to enter the passive audience into art in their isolated and alienated pieces of art to make them part of the communication. And this goes beyond collaboration, beyond talking about collaboration or inclusion or immersion. This may be view on um, parts of the reception process that are very important and we have to overcome them. The production of pieces of art has to be participatory, but also not only pieces of art, but also exhibitions. Um, I want to refer to the documents 15, which is not really an exhibition, but a process of becoming. And here the, the critique, the critic will come about and say, is there something? But the correct question here would be, will there be something and will I be something when looking at the piece of art? So here I am interested in the question, where does this impulse come from? What is, what is the need that is articulated here? Is art here in the development of capitalism? And everybody has to form their own self, of course, in the interplay with others. Or what deficit is the base of this development? You said the notion of participation is not really part of the, discor the discourse anymore, but it comes back from the back through digitalization into the field of art. You were talking about the pros immense. The thesis here is that the cultural practices have changed through social media and the modularization of offers and everybody can be an artist and the audience wants to participate and if we do not feed the audience with this, the audience will just leave us. So we always have to um, work together with, drama, dra with a dramaturgy department and also marketing. Art has to be participatory. And I would like to add here that even if the term is maybe old, through digitalization, it came back. But we have to differentiate the term of participation from the 1990s, where it was a maybe lame, alienated audience that does not know what is good for themselves. And they have to be woken up. They have to be stirred. Art has to have an irritating um, sense on them and here participation has to take the task on and today this is just different and I noticed that there is a certain topos for good reasons and it has overcome has been overcome we are talking about um, self um, relying audience and we are thinking um, of everybody at the same level art is not authoritarian but without hierarchies if possible but what are the good reasons you were talking about? You talked about the good reasons why there was this change. And the second question for Torsten Michaelsen would be if 
you see your piece of art as a hierarchical act. That would be the difference here. One of the big reasons is that society changed. Society changed when looking back 30, 40 years, it was different. Of course, um, that could be a whole other panel, but I just want to talk about Reckwitz and his singularity thesis. It, there is a difference between these societies. They have to learn what subjectivity is, maybe still have to, but there is a pluralization of the society. You can take part in society. There are no more gatekeepers, etc., etc. But where is the need, where does the need for harmonization come from? That is in the back of a lot of movements, and that also um, is linked to the need of a society that was that sees itself as maybe um, at war, and this leads to a to a, an art that wants to bring peace and the question what links us together. At the Dumenka, at the Documenta, the motto was make art, not war. And we there we talked about what our shared values are and not only where the differences are. And this leads to two authors at the beginning of this year. They came up with the idea that there has to be a, a poet in parliament, literature and art as um, an, a tool of power, not only um, criticism in the distance, but embedding art into society. There we can also notice that um, separating art from everything else is has to be overcome, is overcome. And the participatory art has the chance, as you already said in the introduction, to get people out of their comfort zone. When thinking back to early participatory art by Frostel, for example, this this was um, in an after-war, post-war um, landscape. It was about destructing and taking yourself out of the everyday life. So participatory, the element was not 100% in this development of harmonization. But let's think about performances by Signa, for example, or groups that try to challenge up until just leaving the um, performance. Our piece, Rausch and so on, also bases on the, the thought, what am I doing on a content basis? And we also um, think about our critique here. I have to be the subject in this performance. And for us, it is first and foremost not about a subject play. I um, do not take the part as an authentic subject, but just play the piece of art. In this play, we have a chamber where you can um, where you can go back to and then there you can reflect on on literature or be confronted with it and that is these are the things that where we want to say that you can treat them you can you can treat them in different ways but they are always a challenge we are not um, starting from the idea that we have shared values. And I would like to say that we have to look at different aesthetical strategies and see how they work out. The question if you took the decision, decision to go in the participatory um, direction, was this 
was this an argument that we do not want to put the piece of art at the stage and um, preach from above and but activate the audience or was it the, the theory of Brecht that said um, the developing the Lehrstück on the stage going back from distance and I wanted to go back to the notion of power and hierarchy we also wanted to always um, show structures of power um, with the body or with the situation we would never and this would also be naive we would never um, use the radio as in the radio ballet that you already mentioned the as a power free zone but it is about looking at how through rooms or orders how can we put power into bodies if we had a performance with negative gestures and we had 200 300 persons who listened to this performance and and who uh, put this um, system of power out of work we always want to transport this question but this only works with alternative organizations and communication and it and it's only viable for a certain amount of time we have to ask ourselves the question of power and this is a political question and it cannot and we cannot say that we will have a power free zone of communication what what is what what I think is a question is why is the question that art has to be constructive constructive so important for good reasons but for me it seems that um, this is getting stronger and stronger and I would be a I'm interested in your opinion on this because you were always talking about the media of radio. Does this have something to do with the new media, the social media, where there are these polemics and this craziness and these um, uh, new theories? There is um, such a big echo from these social medias, and maybe you get the feelings that we have a lot of this in society and art and does art has have to to um, set a new register here and we have to we have to see where does um, a reason play into this where can we um, where, where can we be reasonable and if I understand correctly if I understood the new models correctly, they called it dark forest. When I listened to this pres presentation, I felt I, I had to go back to my media practical um, origins because of these feedback loops of the social media they are the these dark forests first say that we have to organize ourselves again in the media movement of the 80s the 90s 90s we wanted to build up the free radio which was a legacy media we came from the old media but we wanted to build a political organization that makes new um, situation possible but that does not mean that everybody can just do whatever they want of course more freedom is always possible and do do we not need a hierarchy free organization and this also played into the social media and fulfilled itself but on the background that these platforms are capitalist and that this effective these effective media are a model of uh, a, a market model 
And we have to come back from this. At least that is what I understood from the new model. We need an organization that that has the 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 production in their hands because of course this is also about production capitalism took away this platform it is about posting as much as possible i would like to add to a question that you mr rauterberg asked this um, longing for harmonization, participation came from another direction. But Mr. Michaelsen, you said that this was a reaction to the um, polarization of society, going back to harmonization, making friends not art. This is um, the buzzword of the documenta. I would be interested in seeing where is the space of a critique of this um, need for harmonization. Where can we criticize and what can be criticized? Or do we need criticism? Where would be the space for this? I think that for criticism, this is a, um, a good development. I, give I can give another example for this harmonization. We want to heal, we want to repair. There you can, um, you can notice it in a very constructive way what we want to think art is. If we say part of the criti critique could be being destructive, there we can, we can um, we can achieve more. Where are the needs of society? How can we fulfill these needs? And does this make it possible for a critic like me? Where am I? What are my criti criteria? Do I want to follow this movement? Do I want to maybe um, be the one that? is negative in this. Of course, um, there, are, uh, there are new fields of conflict that open up here. May I turn the question back to you? Yes, I share your experience. What about you, Doctor, as a critic? Well, you try to classify phenomena as you did, for example, um, by the example of document in your conclusive texts, uh, where you stated once again what the spirit was from which this came. Why was uh, this f form of documenta until those events happened? Why was it accepted in a positive manner? Well, because uh, they have tried to undermine the power of the art market to think about non-Western forms of art, which would be a reference to our initial description. Well, you may discuss things like Auguste Boal, the theater of the oppressed. Uh, there are more and more theatrical forms that interfere with social practices. Uh, you may also mention this as a female or a male critic. So I would say idealization of theatrical practices. We are still in a position that we still can write on it. Uh, the, your argument, Christina, that you mentioned, when it is about uh, communalities of values or value communities, Mr. Rauterberg, you stated this. What is uh, being practiced there is closely interwoven with an existential practice of uh, the artists themselves. Uh, do I criticize the political stance of those artists when I criticize them? Well, I find this difficult in the critical assessment. I do not know whether you share this view. Well, I myself have a rather ambiguous stance towards it. On the one hand, I admire or I am somehow are taken by awe how many questions have resurfaced that have been quelled for years and years. Uh, who is allowed to speak 
quite obvious. Who needs uh, acknowledgement? Why are there so few women in the art market? Why are so few women successful? What, what is it that uh, the Western world, despite uh, this self-praise, uh, refers only to itself or has been doing so for a long time? Why have these questions of provenance popped up so late? Where do the objects come from that we admire in the museums? We need to ask ourselves. Yes, of course, we, do, we have. Well, I feel a sort of uh, embarrassment or shame because I, myself, and we, being part of this community of artists and critics, believe uh, quite often we, that we are the avant-garde, we are the, on the right side of things. Quite often this turned out to be a fallacy. So in so many respects uh, it appears uh, that uh, art criticism has been much more conservative than one might suppose. The preserving forces are much stronger than you might think. So I welcome uh, this questioning of so many firmly entrenched positions. Whether this uh, leads uh, to the encapsulating of value communities, well, we might run the risk. I think it's rather a transitional phenomenon, apart from the fact that even in the past we had value communities. Uh, for example, the value community of the abstract painters, because you felt a, a closer link to abstract painters uh, than to figurative painters. So we did see in the past such value communities, but as of now, effectively, we have a new situation. And this is a difficult situation for both male and female critics uh, that certain critical positions have taken the foreground that any criticism of artistic forms of expressions is considered to be also a criticism of the values that are expressed in those works of art. So you cannot separate the two things. At times, it is uh, down to the fact the works of art or artists uh, tend to immunitize themselves against uh, any criticism, because any criticism leveled against them is considered to be an outrageous attempt uh, or to violate human rights or so. Uh, or let's take climate uh, policies. Anybody criticizing climate politics, well, is criticized as being against uh, fighting the climate change. Uh, any ambiguities are ruled out. Or is it just propaganda, art degenerating into propaganda? It would be better suited for Instagram accounts or as a poster art on the street. Where are the differences? Well, I think it's interesting because so many things are interwoven, so many different forms of uh, public are interwoven. That's right, but following up on your idea that art may be committed to a certain societal or political purpose in a rather activist or social practice, may be emerged, uh, may be part of a social practice. The toolbox that we have been using so far is no, no longer relevant, quite simply. For example, you are committed to justice as a social practice. Then it does not matter whether the way to this end is a good one or an artistic one or a, a complex one, because uh, the success is the measure of the quality of the work of art. So that would be my assumption. I think this is a rather strange idea to write a, a yeah, purpose fulfilled, but the way towards it uh, didn't look so good all the time. Well, coming back to the documenta, it was not just about uh, well or, or good intentions uh, that somehow failed as a work of art. No in uh, the work uh, that uh, Taring Pati, it was about anti-Semite uh, descriptions or depictions. So you might ask, is this art after all when it's just uh, propaganda for human rights or things like that? 
you might uh, also criticize individual artistic methods and uh, you might also criticize them by necessity. This would be certainly one of the remaining tasks of art criticism. You cannot just uh, rest uh, on your laurels and uh, stop working by, by just uh, saying it's political practice. But because it's not just that, because uh, political practice may use uh, dangerous and risky images. Let me counter this. Uh, the trends towards harmonization might come also from digitization. Uh, the, I would say on the internet, you find conflicts and war all the time. But uh, another thesis is uh, the bubble formation algorithmization, well, the physics of the internet. Lotman called it like this. When I wander around on the internet, big question for journalists, both female and male. We, we quite often we talk about uh, playful, playing around. Uh, communities are shaped as bubbles. So. This uh, forming of value communities is uh, affected uh, on the internet while the theatrical performance as such is just affirmative. Well, yes, this risk exists in so many respects yeah, that you confirm or affirm just yourselves. Uh, distance as a mode of uh, art criticism or assessment of art. Uh, no longer is art a way of distancing oneself from oneself as a sort of alienating um, or art as a mechanism to reaffirm each other mutually. I think the two forms need not exclude each other. Well, autonomy, it's a Western, well, this is uh, the Western ideology of um, old men, well, with reference to Taring Padi, well, I would say if the curators, both male and female, had gotten the idea, well, it's not just one-to-one -one a poster, but uh, uh, look at this not as a poster, a political statement, but as a work of art. If they had changed the framing, look at this, that's how we thought back then. It's part of the history of our thought. We not always took a second look. Quite often we were not held accountable for what our picture showed. If you had historicized uh, these uh, pieces of art, then the scandal would have been muted very soon. It would not have led to the scandal and to the removal of this piece of art, uh, something that has not really been digested. It has been a highly traumatizing event for the entire audience and the art community. Taren Party, this example is uh, just an example where one work is confronted in a very classical sense. It's not an immersive social practice. This, well, just to clarify the conceptual frame, it was a fairly traditional work of art. It was very traditional, and therefore, this uh, criticism that was leveled against it, that you may criticize this uh, piece of art uh, with uh, regard to aesthetic criteria. That's clear. But in my approach, it's rather about uh, analyzing art uh, that becomes totally emerged in social practice. But I do not know whether this is right, because the, the entire project of Tari Pading was uh, cherishing an, a participative approach. For example, with uh, school classes should create certain figures. You should learn how can we become active for our works? How can we activate others for our ideas? It was also seen as a 
teaching lesson, yes, activating, yeah, absolutely, but this uh, specific uh, work of art, well, Mr. Michaelson's idea was, uh, well, as a critic, you cannot just rest your hands in your lap. Uh, what's my job? What else is left to do? No, with your toolbox, you can criticize this work of art. It's a totally different starting point from this uh, totally immersive work of art. To put it rather poignantly as a thesis, we found the following wording. Art criticism becomes uh, much more difficult or even impossible. Just to, to, to clarify this with greater precision, well, well, Mr. Rauterberg, you uh, ask the question, how free is art? Uh, and you st wrote that uh, a formation of consensus should be achieved by eliminating deviating views. This book uh, dates back to some years ago. Well, looking at the more recent developments, it is an effect that has increased, or do we need a more differentiated perspective? You need to differentiate once again. Which part of the art scene are we talking about? Well, there are certain forms of homogenization and certain ideas of what should never occur. Well, I think you can these this uh, out there in the open in certain areas. It has to do with a certain Geistfeindlichkeit, animositor to anything spiritual, uh, certain ways of abstraction that uh, we are called upon to perform. Art asks us not to relate everything to oneself. I think this is also a mode of the reception of art which is not totally unthinkable. And, uh, to th in as much as I refer everything to myself and want to be confirmed, well, one thing becomes clear, certain things uh, are considered to be untenable or unbearable. Museums and galleries uh, have started contextualizing everything. Well, contextualizing, that's the big new movement. Well, uh, this um, hate of spirituality has to do with anti-intellectualism, which has been very strong. Think of the surrealists and their idea that uh, the, the proper event uh, was happening in dreams, and we should uh, uh, we should switch off uh, reason. So uh, I hope I do not uh, bore anybody with my continuous reference uh, to the. Uh, this uh, barn of rice, uh, the agricultural metaphors, uh, the um, uh, ideas of soil and the compost as the guiding idea, they reactivate such ideas of uh, distancing oneself from anything intellectual. We have huge areas of misunderstanding. For example, this uh, metaphor of soil and the origins. Look at the 20th century. And even the anti-intellectualism of so many reactionaries, uh, uh, reactionary philosophers uh, have promoted this. When we talk about participation and sharing, and when we say, OK, let's get away from this insistence of autonomous artists and art, we want to get rid of hierarchies. Well. You need to take a second look. Uh, what's the tradition? What are the footsteps that I'm walking on? Footsteps of anti-intellectualism. What is it? Equality or homogeneity? And as a critic, uh, will we start homogenizing everything? Uh, and for me, as a critic, this is uh, quite inspiring. Or let's say it is a uh, valuable question. Mr. Michaelsen, you do work a lot uh, with uh, negative role models. You exercise uh, negative role models in a more or less distancing form. 
My impression is that this has become a rarer phenomenon. The positive role model, the positive society, has become a more dominant theme in the theater. So people say, we do not want negative uh, events being represented, no conflicts, please, nor do we want to see all the time the problems of society uh, in the applications or in even in the publishing or the issuing of grants, let's say. Please uh, submit a draft of a desirable society. What's your take on this? Are you rather a lone runner here? Well, whether I'm a lone runner, well, I, I <laughs> dare not pass a judgment on this. Uh, I mentioned uh, a few cases of participatory art. They were rather aiming at irritation or alienation, well, they do exist uh, or oppress. What you mentioned is certainly important. The genesis of what you are doing is quite often uh, based upon certain public funds that are up for grabs and that for which you can submit. So it's a certain attitude of expectations uh, and you have probably, uh, people have probably interiorized this uh, more intimately than you might think. So more societal relevance, positive role models. Uh, so this would be a conformity pressure exercised by the government. Yes, yes, yeah, but for example, by state-funded uh, academies or awards, well, this is one of uh, the facets uh, that uh, invites me to exercise a certain self-reflexivity of the artistic, of the performative uh, area, because not necessarily do you have to legitimize uh, your own action, not necessarily do you have to use the buzzwords, and there is a certain relevance. Uh, you can affirm this, but you, it's not necessary to do so. So I think it's not impossible to exercise such a practice. In this piece that you mentioned, uh, the, the round heads and the po pointed heads, uh, it's about uh, dealing with Brecht. Uh, it's a highly problematic parable about anti-Semitism. On the other hand, we find it rather exciting to create things that are probably a challenge to the viewer, and you can clarify it uh, afterwards. For us, this is always uh, an important element of the discussion after the performances and after the pieces, and to bring this into the fray. What was the challenge? May I ask you once again, I find this utterly interesting what you are telling us. It, it, it uh, is almost an administrative action. Do you think it's a limitation of your spaces, your artistic spaces? What I described, described as the need for applications, this is of course, um, limiting us um, because of the constitutions. We exist, we as groups exist because there is a broad amount of funding that makes it possible to realize projects also over um, a longer period of, period of time. And um, we live on the basis of this. And the alternative would be um, artistic um, um, income. This um, works differently in Germany, and the rhythm in which we live is um, is presumed by the necessi necessity of new societal trends and to see them and to change something here. So, in so far, I would say that this is a form of conformity also with 
and we also have to take ourselves out of this sometimes and we have to find a way through this through this the streams that we have to follow I don't know if other people can work differently in this but the the traditional theater maybe gives more room to play but maybe they are dependent on a on um, abonnements. So um, this is more a um, art of, of um, offers. But does this go along with a different understanding of art, the question of autonomy? This was the incentive here. Of course, um, one would say for oneself that um, would we would work autonomously on what um, we were um, offered, but only in the form of a comprom compromise. This is only possible in the form of a compromise. Um, we can also maybe talk about the work of us as jurors. There is this program, there are these buzzwords and the work of the of jury jurors is in the sense to to see there is an application that is very exciting and has no buzzwords but we still try to fund this application but of course this is at least an ambivalent situation politics are always talking about the freedom of art but then are um, uh, starting these programs. But this brings me to a point where I want to say as journalists, when working with um, big media houses, we are also, um, this also touches upon us, the relevance, the situation of relevance that the classical review as it was um, described in the um, introductory statement has to give a reason why it is happening at all. The theater um, critique has to give a reason why they are talking about this and this performance. It's about gender, it's about climate, it's about Ukraine, and this is a reality in media houses that is increasing, which also leads to is, which is um, one of the reasons why um, reviews are um, declining. Of course, this is always a question of relevance. We try to be very diverse, but still there are still twice as much, thrice as much text that we can publish. So we have to decide which texts to publish. Of course, this plays a role. Of course, there is a definition that relevant should be what is um, relevant for the public today. And we have also to, we have also, we have to see what art says to this. Of course, in Ukraine, we have, um, we have an R, a war, but we ask the representatives of the um, Akademie der Künste what they say to this because we presume that art has a new perspective on this. If this is really relevant, I don't know, but coming back to participation, this has something to do, in my opinion, that a lot of hierarchies for good reason are not existent anymore not only in visual arts or theater, the time of the great Zampanos, the great stars, is over. And this is not a problem for me, but of course, for a long time, um, we were waiting for the new um, work of Peter Stein or Basel. We knew these people also um, beyond our field of work. People knew these artists. And I have the experience 
only I'm touching upon one example. There was a big congress and a discussion in Cologne. Every year we had this congress. Every year they wanted to talk about the topic of art. And I said, invite Vitor Steil. This could be um, a great idea. Never heard of him. This was five years ago, but maybe you um, know her today. And this is um, the the other side of the medal of these um, um, of this sort of hierarchy. The discussion beyond your own field is getting increasingly difficult. Maybe we should come to an end because we also want to make it possible for the audience to ask questions. When we are on the institutional um, um, layer, there is one last thing we would like to discuss with you. Treating critic, critics and critique from the view of institutions or artists. And here we had the impression that there are two trends at the moment. The participation um, of critic in institution, which means um, critiques are ordered to write um, programs or um, partake in the writing of magazines. This opens up the questions question to the independence of the press. And the second movement that might be happening at the moment is excluding art from the immersive setting. So we don't need critique from the outside because we are in an immersive setting and everybody is part of it. And we don't really need um, a critical distance position so we can get we can simply get rid of it. Christina, you had an interview at the um, Berliner Theatertreffen where they thought about getting rid of the critical jury because they are not as independent as they define themselves. These are the two movements, Mr. Rautebeck, you already said, you talked about the embedded journalist who is part of the institution or the excluded journalist. And I would like to add that with the getting rid of the uh, hierarchies, which I welcome very much, but this also brings up uh, the questioning of classification and criticism. For example, artists um, they say that these, that with these, for example, dramatic awards, why should it be awarded by a jury of experts? Why are we setting these hierarchies? Why are we hierarchizing our pieces of arts? Why do we not just split these awards between um, all the artists? And the other question would be, where? why do we need experts? These, these questions may redefine the space of critique. But this also goes along with a feeling that the, jo the job that we that we do on these panels to try to define and classify um, and this also includes hierarchies. What is new? We have to ask ourselves what is new, what is innovative, what is innovation, what sets the examples for um, uh, developments and what do we have to take into account here? Okay, coming to the to the first point you mentioned, this um, is on the basis of an economic um, basis. New models already showed this last week. We would have to write a lot of um, articles for The Guardian to have an income to live from. And when I talked about the applications, it is possible to 
to include 2,000 euros for someone who is responsible for correspondence for the work of art. And of course, this is an embedded person that receives something that would be not possible in this precarious style of life. And in the second point, I don't really see the danger because I think we could just create a new voc vocabulary to treat participa participatory art in order to to um, to treat them critically. And I can see this happening. The work that we do, we can see that there are night critiques that are neither good nor bad. I also think, I don't have the impression that the critics um, have the impression that they are not able to say anything. Lambert has is talked about the participation break that he also hopes for when he is working with art, that he is not forced um, and that he can just lean back and, um, and look at the art without um, being a producer. He does not have to produce art. He has so many other tasks. So I can imagine that this development also has a counter development. And with this, the role of critique might also change. Maybe this outsider position um, will be will become more important again. And tonight we will talk about the metaverse, and maybe they will also touch upon this topic. I don't know what um, the metaverse is at all, because it's it, it has also been um, present for a long time. We have to describe the non-binary where everything um, uh, in Hamburg there is a digital museum that is um, built up and also another collective that will fill it with the with a images of their dreams, everybody should be able to participate and also immerse into this art. And this is funded in Hamburg by Lars Hinrichs, the founder of Xing. So you can see that there are these alliances um, to try to make the technical word more aesthetic and to work together with um, art to, to to link t the technical word and art. And the individual is um, the person that flows into the system. And here I think that we, we try to look at, uh, look at the differences in the end. Where are the differences? Where does something start and where can I maybe put an end to it again, maybe the need to just to to just finalize things. And maybe this is also the task of critics, maybe to just um, set to, to just finalize things. Critics are they have to to see the differences. And maybe um, we should start again to to see the difference, and also in um, in discussing them with others. And now we are taking a participatory break and ask if there are any questions from the from the audience. Thank you so much. My name is Klaus Steidl. Yesterday I tried to host the panel to form and context. And I thought I was so impressed how intellectual and orderly this panel um, was. And I learned a lot. But the strength of the panel showed on the other side um, a weakness. The intellectualization and the, the focusing on context and absence of form. You mentioned an example that you also lived through, but I am also a um, art critique. And in in Vienna, I visited a participatory artwork. 
its name was Us Dogs. It was very plausible, and I have to describe my experience here in order to make my point. It was an immersive artwork in an old building, and the fiction that was developed was that for a long time, people have lived there that feel like they are dogs. So a trans species fiction, which might correspond to a um, transgender reality. So this is the description. But that doesn't even start to um, describe what I experienced there. There was a young woman who um, who was a mix of human and dog, and where you as you have to take the decision if you want to take part and pet her as a dog. But what does that mean for me as Klaus Speidel, who is not only a um, a viewer but a participant and and at another uh, in another room you can um you go into an apartment and one of the persons shits himself and the 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 um owner of the dog um is uh does not know how to treat the situation and asks you if you want to maybe wash the dog. And for me, this was a weird experience. And also, I saw a quality in this immersive theater. This experience I had was in 2016, and it was um, a very important art experience for me, and most of the one of the most important. And I am a art critique. And the next day, I, I went to the university with my bike, and I asked myself, what are they doing? Of course, it was fiction. I had these experience. I had the experience, and I took my decision, decisions. But for me, it was important that it was participatory, because I took these decisions, not only the concept. One question would be, what role does experience play in the end? Beyond the function of commentary, what does it tell you about Germany today? Well, I like uh, talking about the Sigma. It's a group of artists. It has been in existence for a long time. They belong to those groups of participatory artists. It's a sort of participation that involves you, that challenges you with Sigma. It's uh, normally they construct uh, entire parallel worlds, biotopes, uh, cities most of the times, where you have a secret that you have to explore. You enter into this installation. You are left on your own. You can do whatever you want to. You can take a drink at the bar. But you become the co-author of this work or the author of this work. Because uh, interacting with people, you need to uh, find out uh, What's going on there? For example, why somebody uh, is defecating or why somebody rests uh, their head in your lap, things like that. It's a type of immersion about which uh, we can. We have probably have talked through Ligna. Signa is uh, very much uh, f zooming on emotions uh, or experiences uh, and less on uh, intellectual reflection. But I think experience does play a major role in this type of immersive installations. Even with Signa installations, uh, there are people that uh, I find uh, extremely interesting, uh, to which I react very emotionally, and from which I withdraw. Yes, it's an interesting category of performances where you can learn something about yourself in the best of all hypotheses. Uh, 
immersion. Isn't it also something good? Yes, of course, there is something good about uh, immersion. You can become forgetful of the world. This installation by Arne Imhofer uh, impressed me, and also the Faust production in Venice uh, impressed it because it was not uh, aiming at the totality, because it was clear, OK, there are the performing people, actors, and there are the viewers, on the other hand. But always as viewers, yes, they can go along with it, and they experience it themselves, just for the simple reason, because it was so cramped full that you had to interact with the other viewers. I'm part of this crowd. So this being on the fringe. Uh, in a half immersive experience, I, I'm looking at myself this uh, moment of reflection that is always built into this experience. It's not this totality that sucks you into a totality and uh, merges you into something which you own. But uh, you are challenged. Uh, and, and this is the case in so many of these uh, projects of participation and immersion. I'm totally d'accord. This is again a plea for Brecht, uh, Nikita Davan, quite interestingly. She mentioned him, and she quoted him, as the verse artist, because uh, the paradox on, uh, the paradoxal is not uh, played out to the extreme, even with Signa. You remain always yourself. It's not necessary to. But please, uh, by the way, I'm an, an actor by profession. This uh, fiction does not work out. The f fiction is always uh, the fiction of a full immersion. Yes, you. Uh, there is something like a quest. You have to find out something. But uh, living in this story world, not to follow the story, but you uh, become immersed in a story world. Something that so many people appreciate when they watch uh, these TV series. It's not a, uh, well, I don't like it if uh, this aesthetics of, uh, watch out, this is just theater. Don't take it uh, seriously. I think um, uh, I, uh, I find this more attractive than just creating this community of Hunschen, so a strange creature, mixture between dog and man. First, I need to present myself uh, so that you know from which uh, uh, Alina Reiter. I'm a film critic. I live in German. I come from uh, from uh, Latvia, but I work for both countries in both languages. I, it was my pleasure to participate also in the section of film criticism. What I wanted to point out, what I, from my viewpoint, uh, are observing increasingly. You mentioned this about the inner contradictions, uh, the um, paradoxical nature uh, to which you are exposed as a critic, especially at times of post-autonomous art. Well, this is not only a matter of the history of art, the perception of a work of art or how you perceive it, but also geographically in a situation. Um, it's always uh, a geographical situation, although it is quite often said that value judgments are imminent. There is a certain contradiction. What I see this uh, day in, day out, uh, very much to the liking of Ms. Wahl, I may report on what I have been seeing, Theresa. Uh, uh, from Hermannstadt in uh, Latvia, there was a piece produced, it is called Postscriptum, a solo production, a solo show by Choplana Kormatova, you know her in Germany, as the love interest in, uh, uh, in uh, character, Goodbye Lenin, by Daniel Brühl. She was one of uh, the most famous Russian actresses. Uh, on the 24th of February, she escaped or the move to Latvia. Aus Hermanns uh, was uh, registered in her theater in summertime. 
this uh, piece uh, premiered where she is on stage two hours. I haven't seen it, but on Monday, Choplana Karmatova received the Latvian uh, Theater Award as the best uh, Latvian actress of the year. And the judgment of the jury was unanimous. But uh, there was an, it triggered an enormous outcry amidst uh, the young generation of theater critics. And three years ago, there was uh, a review of Postscriptum that was very positive. Uh, Hermann Stetter, what uh, Chapla, uh, Chaplova uh, does on the page, it is shared uh, dynamically on Facebook. Uh, S uh, look, the uh, true German film critics have recognized uh, that this is such a great piece of theater, and what Choplanova carries out is uh, grandiose. But the interesting thing is that the author of the review is a very famous Russian film critic who has moved to Berlin. So you see how contradictory these trends are. Even a, a geographical situation in certain geographical contexts. Uh, so, as Mr. Rauterberg uh, put it, uh, there are so many questions uh, where I am loath to give a black and or white or yes or no answer. May I now interfere? There are two questions extant and about three minutes. Please be brief. I saw Mr. Gard Thank you. I uh, found this conversation extremely inspiring. This correspondence, uh, the review, is it uh, the, uh, the type of uh, art criticism? There is a notorious reproach to the language of art criticism. Mr. Kudiek uh, resonated with this, of a certain vagueness, obscurantism, and difficulty, unattainability. Uh, say, will I say something about gender and post colonies? Important, relevant. You said also exciting. These are um, commonplaces. Uh, this is art speak, uh, as they say in English. It's bound to contemporary art. But today, we have also descriptions of exhibitions about Dutch painting in the 17th, 18th century. Never would they level this reproach against this. It's always against documenta-like art, this allegation. Why is it? We have two forms of text. Uh, is it uh, the art that requires such a strange wording, or are there social reasons? Well, the allegation is always it's uh, dark, it's un not understandable, it's pretentious, it's oblique. Participatory, any participative art, this lumbung concept at the documenta, this open, let's talk to each other, we are sitting together. Wouldn't that not require also a more open language, a more communicative language? Am I right? Or am I not right? So it's about the correspond the interrelation between the language of art and the language in which you describe art why is it that again and again this allegation is leveled against uh, the discourse of contemporary art uh, or wouldn't it be uh, something like a new language that would be required for participatory works of art that's my question Thank you so much for your discussion. Uh, I find it inspiring in many reasons. Well, saying no is the beginning of speech. Just participating, uh, just uh, become smooth and cozy. It's uh, the fear of losing identity. Your example of Signa, I would say it's a, it's a violation of uh, the um, inviolability of the arts. I prefer the plural, the arts rather than art. Uh, 
For what would, for example, caregivers say about this, or caring personnel, or nurses, uh, or also animal guardians? Or you fall back into the outdated to the friend, enemy, and together. Let's take documenta rice barn and a bowl of rice. However, the rice, the field of rice, is not the soil on which our conflicts are fought out, but it's the asphalt of the streets. It's our generation. Who does it belong to, asphalt? Is it correct that for 30 or 40 years, why is it always the right of the car drivers? Why don't we allocate the streets primarily to pedestrians? Why don't we run a higher risk? That's the democracy. It becomes more difficult with the, the caricatures, the Tanga Lua. Fifty years ago, I went to Bangladesh, Thailand. Uh, there were comics in Hindi, Bengali, all over the place. Who was depicted? The fat British capitalist, the Prussian military, the greedy Jew, the fat missionary. And all those caricatural figures are very popular in all of Asia. It's, uh, these are ancient things uh, that they bring. People should have treated. These are the old animals. Uh, the things become only exciting with the caricatures of Muhammad. One statement on the correspondence. <laughs> this was rather a statement. Thank you. It was not a question. But there were also concrete questions on the language of criticism and also the language of the work of art. Well. I would suggest, uh, well, you may add something on with one statement or so. It's always uh, also linked to the fact that in contemporary art and in talking about contemporary art, that uh, the reporting for economical reasons and for vested interests, uh, figurative art and theater is quite often hinged upon questions of relevance. It's no longer taken for granted in all media. In my view, this uh, is closely linked to the fact that you you use this language to legitimize yourself. And also with the development of the arts, the arts themselves uh, are not exempt from societal general questions. Uh, this is a movement that has taken place for decades. Uh, the interesting thing is, uh, do you need a different language? In our preparatory talk, we considered, well, you would end up with uh, participative formats with a report on experiences, uh, what I have experienced, uh, reports, uh, things that I have witnessed. So you are miles away from a true criticism. You somehow need to close this gap, like in Signa. Well, I need to describe my experiences. But what is the implication? What is uh, What comes out of it? I would share this view. We have rather uh, seen a secularization of uh, cr art criticism and the mystical eulogy of art that dates back to the Renaissance. Well, it does still exist when it comes to selling art. But I can talk about myself uh, this uh, aspiration to a common language, understandable language, uh, living texts, uh, well, is a uh, common purpose. Things uh, that have been uh, brought up again and again, I wouldn't say that this uh, holds true, I would say. Uh, there has been something like a progress. Is it safe to say? OK, but uh, you must never lose uh, negativity. You must never let go of political discussions. You must continue them.